Hey all, welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren, I'm your host, and today I've got another great guest, Mr. Bob, Barbecue Bob Trudnick. He is of Barbecue Guru, and Bob was uh, crucial in getting the first barbecue pit temp controller on the market. We're going to talk to Bob about how they came about and where they're going in the future. I'll be right back with Barbecue Bob. Smoking, grilling, getting hot and hotter. Hey all, I want to welcome back Inkbird Products as a sponsor of the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Inkbird makes some great thermometers, Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, all that. They also make a great instant read thermometer that I really love. It's waterproof, totally rechargeable with USB, very accurate. Everybody should have one of these in their kitchen so they can check the internal temperatures of their food so they don't end up overcooking. Check out the waterproof instant read thermometer below and a link to Amazon from Inkbird. Welcome back, Inkbird Products. Welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren, I'm your host, and I have a great guest again today. Um, I've been wanting to get him on for a while. Mr. Bob Trudnick, 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 Trudnick. 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 <laughs> my tongue tied here for a second. He is the man behind the barbecue guru. And um, I want to welcome you, Bob, and uh, anxious to get you on so we can talk about this. Uh, tell us where you're from, who you are, and all that. Well, first of all, Darren, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm excited to talk to everybody about barbecue and the history of barbecue guru. So, uh, yeah, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I was born and raised uh, in the northeast part of the state and then moved down to southeast Pennsylvania um, where I met Shotgun Fred Perkle back in 1999. Uh, Shotgun Fred was an inventor. He was from San Antonio, Texas. I started doing some marketing for him. And, you know, within a year or two, we came up with the Barbecue Guru product. Uh, and it's been amazing to see and and see the product develop from the ground up to be a part of that uh, with just an amazing group of people, engineers and, you know, Fred's amazing mind and, you know, just developing it. You know, the first time that we uh, introduced the Barbecue Guru Control to anyone was probably Memphis and May of all places um, back in 2003. And we had a backpack full of these controls that we had on and we were just trying to share them with people, you know, put them on your smoker. Let's see what happens. Yeah. A lot of people thought we were crazy and, you know, some people thought, yeah, let's give it a shot. So that's how it all started. So how old were you when you got involved with them? I mean, were you fresh out of school or were you in school or, how, how, I mean, did you have another career before that or? Well, I, yeah, I have a degree in photography and marketing and, um, so cooking, I always loved cooking. Cooking's been a passion for me. Uh, I thought about going to culinary school after my other degrees and decided, you know, I mean, I know enough and love cooking enough to be able to teach myself, um, but really wasn't introduced to real uh, traditional barbecue until I met Fred and started working here. But I can tell you when I was seven years old, um, I overheard my father and my grandfather talking about cooking crayfish in a, uh, you know, just freshwater crayfish in a, in a coffee can. And that was on a Sunday. On Monday, I uh, went to my cupboard, into my mother's cupboard, opened up a fresh can of Folgers, dumped all the coffee in the trash, filled it with some fresh, clean water, got my local crayfish, built a little wood fire in the backyard, stole some matches. <laughs> At seven years old, it's probably not a good thing. And uh, <laughs> cooked those crayfish up. And my dad came home from work. He didn't know whether to slap me or hug me <laughs> because uh, it was, I did a pretty good job of it, actually. So I've been cooking on charcoal. When I was a kid, you know, we had a gas grill, but my dad got that Weber kettle. He got the kinks for charcoal. And we made sure that every time we were cooking, for the most part on weekends, we were cooking over the coals. Yeah. I mean, I'm from upstate New York originally. I grew up there, moved down to Florida back in 79 or so. But mm -hmm. I mean, when we grew up, I mean, it was all charcoal, you know, and the lighter fluid, especially. <laughs> you remember that? Oh, yeah. Stuff? But yeah, uh, we, you know, we, we, had, 
we had something called uh, Cornell chicken up there that was, you know, every summer that's, you know, they had big barbecues, festivals, and, you know, the, you know, fundraisers for the, you know, fire departments and stuff like that. It was all that kind of, you know, just cooking over the coals, whether it was, you know, hot dogs or you know, hamburgers, chicken, what have you. Um, there wasn't really a lot of the low and slow barbecue like like there's, you know, a lot more of today. Not, exactly. not that I can remember, you know, anyway. Um, that kind of came later. I just remember the charcoal grilling and, and all that was uh, big time back then. So so you kind of like are me, you know, you kind of fell in love with cooking early on in your career or actually when you were younger. Um and it's funny that you say that you didn't go to school for it or you didn't go to culinary school. But, you know, I, I've talked to a, a few people that have culinary careers that didn't you know, go to culinary school. Uh, one of them that surprised me was Kenji Lopez-Alt, who, you know, who he is, you know, he, he went, he's a, he studied architecture in college and, you know, was working part time in restaurants through college and just fell in love with it and decided to just, you know, pursue his career, you know, as a chef working, not going to culinary school. So yeah. he learned all he did and, and produced, you know, all the stuff that he does just from, just like you and me learning on our own and, and creating and, and, uh, and practicing. So, so it sounds like you were doing a little bit of something and you worked. Uh, so talk about when you got involved here with, uh, with uh, this company, because it wasn't so, it was electronics company, correct? Is what what it was that you started with? Uh, actually, no. Uh, the company I started with, Thermo Megatech, which is the parent was a parent company of Barbecue Guru. There actually was no Barbecue Guru when I started. Right. Thermo Megatech is an industrial valve company, and Shotgun Fred had like twenty seven patents in this industry and in these products, these mechanical valves. So. Fred was always the kind of person who wanted to look for a lot of different channels of, of sale and a lot of different paths of, you know, different products to see what would hit and what would, you know, he was an ex sure. experimenter and he kind of taught me to be that way. And so him and I would always sit down, sketch stuff out uh, in the kitchen at lunchtime. We both love food. We both grew up in families that were, everything was homemade. And, um, you know, we just, you know, loved to design products in the food industry. And then we got a phone call one day from a ship's engineer who was using one of our valves, our temperature control valves on a ship down in Florida. And he had a ceramic grill. And he just posed the question, hey, do you ever think about doing something, you know, with this technology for cooking? And, you know, Fred and I had the conversation with him. Fred ran with the idea. We came up with a mechanical valve. As we were testing the mechanical valve that sat on the stack of the ceramic smoker, uh, we noticed like some of the guys in the shop were the smoke was blowing in and they were complaining about it. So we ran a fan, a big industrial fan, to blow the smoke out the bay door. And we saw that valve modulate shut, that mechanical valve. Mm -hmm. So then it was the idea of wait, we can con we can do this with a fan. Instead of controlling the stack, we can control the air electronically. And that's how the electronic barbecue guru began. We had a, our, our first uh, control that wasn't mechanical. It was called the competitor. And then we just moved forward from there. Now, you didn't start competing in barbecue till after you started developing the product. Is that right? Or Well, yeah, I, it was after Memphis in May, which was our the first event we went to. Um, I saw that whole new world of competition cooking, and I immediately fell in love with it. I've always been passionate about cooking i grew up in an italian right. family right so there was homemade pastas all over the kitchen table and meatballs in the oven and you know all that stuff so you know after we went to that event and saw what it was all about you know it was like a light bulb went off and i said you know what fred we have to have a cooking team we can't just be uh a business out there selling to these people we need to be these people we right. need to get out there and cook and we need to understand it completely and we're going to have a heck of a time doing it and let's sell some product while we're at it. Yeah. You definitely got to know if you're trying to sell something to somebody, you got to understand what they're looking for, especially in, in who knows better than, you know, barbecue competitors, what they need. And exactly. you can't sell them something if you're going in there and you have no clue in what they need trying to sell them something. And they'll just, they'll just tell you, you know, Hey, you know, I don't need this thing. So you got to understand what they go through and how they operate. Um, 
to be able to sell it to them. Well, that's, that's kind of great. So, and, and, and it amazes me that either the thing that you are originally designing is, is um, another competitor of yours now. Um, what is, uh, what is it? The, what do they call that thing? The slow bot or something like that? Or the slow bot? Oh, slow bot. Slow bot. Cause that, that's yeah. what that is. It's all it does is control your top vent, you know, right. <laughs> electronically controlled top vent, which I don't think can really perform as well as like the barbecue guru can by controlling the fan you know, cause it can actually stoke the fire hot and you can, you know, actually get it up to searing temperature. It makes it easier for you to do a reverse sear where you can keep it at, uh, you know, 225 for a certain amount of time, take the meat off and then crank that fan up and get it up to searing temperatures within minutes and, and do it. So, so yeah. So when you guys got these, you know, started playing around with them, went to Memphis in May, what was the reaction when, when you, when you went there? I mean, would they all open arms and they say, you know, was there some people going, yeah, I, I know how to my pits and my, you know, I can do my pits by touching it with my hand and all that. Well, it's, it's funny because looking back at it, you know, you don't go to a world championship barbecue and say, here, try a new product on your smoke. Yeah. This you guys need this because you don't know what you're doing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so looking back is, is pretty funny that we our timing of things, but we just knew that that was, we started this and uh, we put our first product on the market in March. And that was the first big event coming up for us. It was, there's Memphis in May. Let's drive to Memphis, see what it's all about. So we had a mixed bag of, of uh, responses. Um, we had guys who kind of looked at us like we just came off of an alien ship from Mars. Right. <laughs> uh, we had guys that thought, you know, what are you thinking, man? You can't connect a computer to a charcoal fire and expect anything good to happen there. Um, and we had guys that said, Hmm, that's an interesting concept. No, thanks. And then we had some guys, uh, my, my good buddy, Joseph from Houston. Now he, uh, he was with a team called poking eye back then. And he competed in, in all those events and he welcomed us with open arms said, come on, let me show you my rig, have a crown Royal and let's talk about this. And I'll never forget it. Uh, once we explained the concept to him, he had uh, some backwood smokers there. And he let us drill into his backwood smoker because back wow. then we, we didn't have an adapter. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have an adapter back then for the backwood smoker. But uh, he let us drill into one of his pits, which was, you know, pretty amazing to think back on. Yeah, We hooked it up. It kept perfect temperature. And he couldn't even believe it. And, you know, we sat there for, and we, we came early. So we were there on like a Wednesday or Thursday before the competition. And he ran it all night. The next day we came back of our hotel room, came down and chatted with him. Probably poured us another crown royal. And uh, he's like, and he had that real raspy, like Texas voice. He goes, you know what? He goes, guys. And he said a couple of uh, colorful words, but he goes, this thing took the sea right out of cooking. <laughs> but it sure as hell put the D back in drinking. <laughs> yeah, so, more time, more, more drinking time, less, uh, you know, playing right. with the pit. <laughs> That's the thing, you know, I get it. You know, you want to cook manually. Everybody should learn how a barbecue pit works and operates and should be able to handle that. But what he said makes so much sense in a lot of different ways. And, you know, it, it gives you a peace of mind to keep the most precise amount of air in the cooker to maintain temperature because there's a lot of other things going on and it may not all be competition barbecue you know on weekends i have a son and a daughter they're heavily involved in sports um you know you run into basketball games you run into a baseball game you're you know shopping because you know you got this and i got catering business so there's lots of things going on in a weekend and you still want to serve barbecue to people so what this does is it allows you to get everything else done that you need to do, make your sauces, make your seasonings, prepare your house, you know, whatever you need to do and just make sure that, you know, that pit is going to hold at temperature for you when you need it to. Yeah. Well, and really your the barbecue competitor is not your main customer that you're shooting for because that's right. only a small percentage of uh, the population. 
yeah. it's a good test. There are good test uh, beta testers for you because they're doing it all the time. They know what they're doing, know what they're looking for, and they can work the kinks out, help you work the kinks out of the product. But you're really looking for the guys like me who cooks every, you know, you know, couple of days at home for his family. And exactly. like you said, doesn't want to have to sit there and put a brisket on and sit there and babysit it for 12 hours and have, you know, can't do anything else, you know, or right. a fork, right. you know, eight hours on a pork button, you know, while yeah. everybody else is having fun, you know, you're, you're sitting there making sure you got enough, uh, you know, wood on and it's not burning and everything else. So, right. uh, even with the Kamado grills, you know, which I know they're really popular on, they're, they're not the easiest to keep temp on because there's so many other variables that can play out. Like you said, you know, wind and, uh, you know, weather and all kinds of stuff. And sometimes it's just, you know, you get the right, the charcoals a little wet or something, you know, right. it's, it's no, hard it's to, fun. you know, you just never know your pits can always act up. I mean, I've been doing this long enough that, you know, I could load the pit, you know, one day and then the next day, the same exact way. And it performs totally different, you know, Correct. but these will help you actually, you know, uh, do that. What was the technology that you guys used in the original? Because that, that wasn't, you know, today it's all digital. Everything's, you know, yes. you, you you know, digital algorithms and everything are, are playing a part into it. When you first did this, though, that that stuff wasn't around back then. It wasn't. Um, the uh, we have a uh, the Thermomegatech company has a patented product, and it's a heat actuated uh, wax. So it's a wax that has copper in it, and it we have different waxes that will melt and harden at different temperatures. So they'll expand and contract. At different temperatures. So what that allowed is the mechanical uh, control to either open or close by expanding or contracting on the lid, depending on that temperature. So we use that to, to start out, um, and then soon realized that we can do it electronically with the fan, and then moved into that. So it wasn't long before we didn't even get through the whole first summer before we had electronic controls. Awesome. Yeah. So with, with, um, when you, when you developed that and you started marketing it, how, how soon was it where it started catching on where you started having other people in the industry start looking at you guys and going, wow, we, we should, we should develop something like that. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it was a couple of years. Um, that the first couple of years, there was nobody on the market. Right. Um, and then we started seeing a couple pop up here and there. And then really like two years ago, three years ago, it really took off. Yeah. I know nowadays, I mean, especially since everything's kind of digital, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, you got, you know, a lot more people, um, it's making it easier to make these type of things. I mean, you know, it's more difficult building the algorithms out than I think in anything than putting the electronics together yeah. um, anymore because you can, you can pretty much source anything you want from China. Um, right. Since um, there's a lot more you know competition, but Back in the early days when you guys were first developing this and, and put it, you did all the heavy lifting pretty much yeah. for, the whole, for the whole industry. So Sure, sure. Um, so, so where did you take it when you, when you started getting these out there? And then, you know, I guess down the road you started having uh, deals where you made with manufacturers like Big Green Egg. You kind of you know, worked with them, put, put their name on one and all that. Uh, I mean, do you guys still – heavy into doing that kind of stuff? Has that backed off some or? Um, so to get started, you know, we kind of went through, uh, went to trade shows, picked up some dealers here and there. We looked for dealers who carried, you know, the popular grills like Big Green Egg and, and Weber's and things like that. And then, you know, we had a great partnership with Big Green Egg for many years. Um, and we, yeah, we're continuing to do that. I'm, I'm continuing to look for those partners. Um, and But right now, you know, we're focusing on, you know, selling direct. Um, and, you know, if, if other partners come to us, then we're more than happy to work with them and give them their own design, their own look, their own name, and get their brand on it. How hard is it keeping up with the technology? Technology seems to snowball. Um, and when you first started, since you were the first, you had a few years there where you guys were the only ones on the market. Then you started having some competitors come. That usually drives, you know, more um, innovation. And, and, and then, of course, with the advance, advance of technology, you know, things continue to change. How, how hard is it keeping up with it? Because I know you just had a major 
change in the models when you came out sure. with the ultra Q and all that. Right. Yeah. It's not easy at all. Let me tell you, um, you know, it starts with, you know, taking a look at the way the industry's going. Um, you know, sometimes it's driven by what some, somebody else has done. Some, and most of the time it's driven by what you believe you need to set yourself apart. So I, you know, I and my team do a lot of research. Um, you know, we do a lot of, you know, thinking about feature set, what's, which way is, you know, this industry going. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, I come up with a lot of concepts, um, but it's putting, you know, having it come to fruition. Um, the concept is great, but have like looking at the mechanics of it, looking at the firmware, looking at, you know, how things are built and, you know, the costs and things like that. That's when it all comes together. So my concept has to be looked at by a team of people. And then they have to tell me, well, here's what's re here's what the reality of it. And we can do this and we can't do that. And if we do this, we have to do it this way, not that way. Yeah. So there's um, there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of meetings and a lot of eye openers, you know, once a concept comes up to be able to bring it to reality. Yeah. And it's, you can't sit back on your laurels when you're in a technology type business because it's constantly changing. You got to, you know, people are always demanding more and more. And I, I just, I'm sharing the screen now. Um, you can probably see a, with your website and showing that you got the new uh, DynaQ, UltraQ, you know, everything now is Bluetooth and Wi Fi. You know, everybody wants to be able to look at their phone and control everything. It's not just these type devices. It's, the pellet grills themselves now, the uh, even the sous vide circulators. I, I do a lot of mixing sous vide and barbecue, so the sous vide circulators now all have to have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth control, so people can yeah. you know play around with them while they're at the store or what have you. So absolutely, it's a it's a constant you know change and growth, and people just even if they don't use it, they want it. You know, it's, exactly. I, if you see that on the pellet grills, even you know companies that had a really great pellet grill. Um, somebody else comes out with one that's got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and they'll go, people will go buy that one, even though it may be a crappier overall product. And so that forces that company to go, okay, like Weber, you know, they came out with their pellet grill. They waited until they, you know, could put something out with Wi-Fi in it. And now they are a technology company, which they've never, none of their products ever had anything like that before. And now Absolutely. they have to get involved in having an app and software and algorithms and exactly things they never you, really worried about before. Yeah. You definitely need to keep on top of that to stay in this business. Yeah. And that, that's just what amazes me in the barbie, even just the outdoor it's cooking. So yeah, so you guys, you know, have to continue to upgrade and, and, and look at your products and make sure that they're staying competitive and offering, you know, your customers what they want and what they are demanding now. I mean, customers are getting more and more demanding with the, you know, like I said, I, every time I get a, a company on that that's in this business, just looking at all the technology and stuff that it's inserted itself into the outdoor cooking market now is just amazes me. Every year there's still something new. So you, you would never think, you know, looking back 20 years ago, the way it would look today with all the technology and different, different kinds of grills, shapes of grills uh, and all that. Um, now you guys, a couple of years back decided to come out and, and partner with the uh, monolith grill. Um, yeah. so you could pretty much, offer your own, you know, uh, grill with the, with the come out or the, the barbecue gurus, um, attached to it. How did that partnership come about? Um, well, we had a, a division of our, of barbecue guru of our company in Germany. And I started, uh, going over there a few times a year, competing in barbecue contests, help, you know, understanding the market, um, and helping grow that business. So, um, the gentleman that I had running our business in Germany was carrying monolith grills and monolith. The company was only about an hour away from his distributorship. So I was, you know, going to be competing that weekend and they were going to be there. And, you know, he said, he's looking for an exclusive North American distributor. Uh, and I said, well, let's, you know, we'll talk. And, um, we hit it off, uh, 
they're great people over there, uh, Monolith, Germany. Um, the business partnership seemed to work, um, you know, the concept of it. So we said, okay, let's, uh, let's build in a fan. So I want to be out of the box. I want the fan built into the, to the cooker um, so that you can shut that fan off and you can use it manually or you can turn that fan on and you can use it with a control. So we uh, got our first shipment. I guess it's been three years now. And uh, they're doing very well. It's a very versatile cooker. It lends itself well to temperature control. There's a lot of different ways that you can set up your cooker for, you know, traditional slow cook barbecue, for breads and pizzas, for casseroles and side dishes, for direct grilling and searing. Um, so it's just an, an all around great cooker. It comes with all the accessories you can imagine. Um, and it's just like a, it's a, it's a beautiful partnership yeah i'm a big fan i have a uh, kamado joe so i'm a big fan yeah. of uh, ceramic grills so i know what sure. they can do and you know kamado joe's of course they came out to compete with the big green egg and yeah you know, the big thing with them when they came out they included a lot of the uh, you know accessories that you usually had to pay for with big green egg. right now exactly. when, you, when you did this with uh, monolith did that affect your relationship with big green egg at all or or did it not have any kind of we were uh, we were not in their partnership with Big Green Egg at that time. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that was after our partnership, so no, it didn't have any effect on that. Um, you know, and we still we love all cookers, and you know, our controls work on any charcoal grill or, or wood smoker. Um, so we still, you know, push our controls for any grill that you have out there. So we have a lot of different adapters. Yeah, that's another thing I want to bring up, and I'm going to share the screen again because. Um, you guys do one of the things that I guess the benefits of being one of the first to introduce a, uh, a temp controller is that you guys went through a lot of the, you know, okay, we got to make this fit all these different types of cookers. So you actually have accessories and, um, adapters for just about any cooker you could think of that you could put this on. You got a couple different fans. So I guess the larger fan is for bigger your bigger pits, the pit viper is more for your ceramic type grills and smaller uh, smokers, but you got all different kinds of adapters. And I, um, I bought the bulkhead adapter because I have a, I got a hasty bake and um, the mm -hmm. classic, you know, the uh, uh, larger one and they don't really, there's no easy way to put a temp controller on it. So you really right. need the bulkhead adapter um, which, you know, you drill a hole, like you said, you know, that they did on that backwards and you, you know, put this in there so that you can put your adapter on, but you've got just about everything. And I think a lot of the other companies, your competitors actually tell people to buy your, your, uh, adapters because they don't want to go have to go out and do what you guys did and put all these together and right. develop them. Right. So, yeah, that came with a lot of years. So that was another benefit of being on the competitive uh, trail um, was I got to travel the world and see all these different cookers out there. And while I was there, I took my measurements, came back, made our designs, and then started our concepts. And then we would send them to people. So we work a lot with our customers um, and we take a lot of their feedback and design adapters for the cookers that are, are popular and on the up and coming uh, market. So what's, what's interesting is every year, you know, there's, there's new companies, there's new designs, there's new product lines, and that's not easy to keep up with. And it's, right. you know, time consuming, you know, there's a lot of cost involved. It's a lot of stainless steel and machining, but you know, we feel like that is one of those things that helps set us apart is having all these different adapters that fit all these cookers. And, you know, if you have a cooker, that we don't have an adapter that fits, you know, you can call us and we'll work through it and we'll figure out what works for you and we'll, yeah. we'll make those adapters. Well, and it's another, um, you know, profit stream for you guys. Cause even if they don't buy your cooker, they buy or your uh, controller, they buy a competitor's controller. You know, those competitors most likely are not making these adapters. I mean, I know that, you know, the other ones that are out there, you know, don't, and they pretty much tell them, well, you know, go to barbecue guru, and get, you know, for that one. And they'll tell them, you know, Hey, you know, yeah. so, I mean, it's, uh, 
you know, that's at least, at least that's another, you know, avenue of profit that you guys have, even sure. if they, even if they don't buy your, you know, brand of controller, um, you know, they can buy, buy that. So, uh, exactly. and you know, the accessories and stuff that you have with it as well. Um, let, let's talk about the, the shotgun uh, barbecue smoker again. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen so people can see that. Now, is that something that you guys, created yourselves did you partner with somebody on that or well i'll tell you um way back when i mean we were always looking to build our own smoker um and we've had a lot of different smokers over the years we had what was called the tall boy uh we had um a caldera del fuego you know we've had you know a few different cookers uh that, that kind of came and gone and they're great little cookers but um, they were expensive to build, um, and it, we just didn't see a you know a mark that market becoming bigger with those particular cookers. The shotgun smoker came about. Uh, Fred and Mike McGowan at Backwood Smoker were you know good buddies back in the day, and um, you know they used to have a lot of conversations about design. So what we did was we kind of took that basic design of the reverse flow uh, box with you know the firebox underneath being able to have it direct or indirect with the removable pan and you know we had the tall boy smoker which had a 12 by 13 uh, racks and the reason we had those size racks was because we didn't see any cookers on the market that actually fit a full pan you know yeah. the hotel the disposable hotel. Pan. right so you know, it, that, that concept was like, wow, it's, it's such a simple thing. I don't know why none of these cookers actually fit either one or two per shelf. So we took the design and widened it. Um, and instead of it being a deep cooker with a, you know, with a uh, narrow, uh, <laughs> narrow, you know, front end, we reversed it. So it was easy to put that 13 by 12 shelf in, put those full pans in, put those half pans in. So we kind of, you know, made the side, the front, um, and, you know, it's had a few different names and, and design changes over the years. It started out as the Onyx oven. And uh, we were, Fred was very proud of that cooker. And there was a lot of design changes I wanted to make to make it even better. And I've done that. I made 17 changes to it to, uh, and then renamed it the Shotgun Smoker after Shotgun Fred. This was after he passed away. Gotcha. Um, so we made all those changes, like you know, stainless interior, heavy-duty firebox, you know, full welded, you know, corners, um, and welded stack. There's, you know, we put the dolly handle on it and the wheels and the legs. So there's a lot of changes we made to it, and it's it's a rough and tough cooker that, man, it's uh, very very efficient. Who who is your uh, main um, consumer of that? Who who buys that mostly? Is it mostly competitors? Is it um, home cooks? Is it a little bit of both? It's, it's both competitors and home cooks. Um, you know, it's big enough to compete in, and and small enough to put in your backyard. You know, when you're having a party, and you know, you can put six pork butts in there, or you know, two big twenty pound briskets. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's kind of half and half, and a lot of the competitors who use them end up putting it in their backyard and then buy another one for their trailer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I can see it. I mean, I can see, you know, being able to throw, you know, two or three briskets in there and when I'm having a party and then yeah. it not be an overkill to put one in there, you know, exactly. So, yeah. You know, so it's cause you don't, you can still control the fire. You don't have to put, you don't have to fill it up. Like, a, you know, if you were doing a, a stick burner, you know, where right. You throw if you got a huge stick burner, you throw one brisket in there. It's kind of overkill, you know. Exactly. Yeah, so, but that, I don't see this being the case with that at all. I, I kind of like those. I I don't happen to have a, uh, a a smoker like that. You know, I have like I said, I've got the Kamado, I've got a, a pellet grill, and I've got that um, Hasty Bake. Which mm -hmm. Hasty Bake is kind of kind of similar to that. But I like one well, thing I like about the Hasty Bake is it's the adjustable. Um, ash yeah. Meat the coal pan that goes up and down. So yeah, that's very nice. I think that's fun, but um, I, you know, I could always, you know, look at one of these and go, yeah, I could use that. Um, definitely. Um, it's kind of limited use. You can't grill with it or anything, but it, you know, it's not really meant to do that with that. So it's well, more... actually uh, if you, I do grill in it. Uh, if you remove the water pan, 
and you can fit a one of the racks on the very bottom oh. where the water pan would go and just get those coals going and you know we do camp food at the competitions we do steaks and burgers and yeah, i guess you could because it is kind of big enough to uh cook stuff on that's yeah yeah well that's good see I, I wouldn't even have thought of that but i guess when you play around with them enough you know you you you, fi- you figure out things you can use it with yeah you find new ways right so what other um accessories and stuff that you guys came out with over the years because that's like, like you said at the beginning, you know, I guess Fred was like this and you're kind of the same way. You always look for more yeah, things that you can offer customers, more profit, um, you know, uh, streams. So uh, I'm looking at the barbecue um, rib rings. Yeah. Those things look pretty decent. Let me share the screen again. I like, I like to be able to show people what we're talking about when they yeah, watch the video, you know, so, but the rib rings here are uh, pretty cool. Um, is that something you guys, um, you created that and got the patent on, on that? Yeah. So this is an interesting story. Um, it's been about nine, 10 years, probably 10 years now since I came up with this and it, I was sitting at my desk. Um, and I was thinking about, I had like six racks of ribs to cook. All I had back then was a large, big green egg. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to get all those six racks of ribs cooked. Yeah. Uh, and um, I started playing around with, like, just drawing, sketching stuff on a paper. And I thought, you know, if I can make some kind of spiral round rack, because there's no round rib racks out there. I was looking for rib racks on line at stores, and I'm like, they, all, you know, it's a round grill, and I got a rectangle piece of meat. How am I going to handle this? Right. So I just, I came up with the concept of the rib rings ten years ago. And I showed it to some people and we just had so many other priorities back then and initiatives that were going on that it kind of got, you know, put by the wayside. And then, you know, soon after that, Fred's health was, you know, starting to decline and I just kind of forgot about it. And then maybe three years ago, I was going through that, uh, that kind of bin of papers and I saw that drawing and I'm like, I'm going to revisit this. And I presented it to, you know, the group and my look, had my engineers look at it. And everyone was like, wow, this is fantastic. Like, why isn't this out there already? I said, I don't know. You know, it was one of those things that, you know, I thought was a great idea. And then I put it aside and now I'm revisiting it and it took off. So I did a, a little video in my backyard of the first prototype one that was made by our engineering team here. I, and I took it and I cooked ribs on it. It got like over a million views. Yeah. It was insane. <clears throat> yeah. It's amazing to me that, you know, some of these little um, accessories that people come up with, you know, I'll give you an example, you know, uh, Dave Parrish over at Slow and Sear, you know, he developed that for the Weber kettles, um, the Vortex, which is technically a piece of sheet metal that's shaped like a cone, but, you know, probably costs yeah. five bucks to make, but, you know, it's versatile. I mean, you could, you know, take your kettle grill and, you know, you know, cook, put the coals in the middle of it, put them on the outside and you got, you know, you can do the indirect. I mean, little things like that, that people look at and go, man, that's a, you know, it looks like a little thing, but it it can help you so much with, uh, with, with cooking, you know? So. Yeah. And I'll tell you for the backyard cook, you got a Weber, you got a ceramic grill, any round grill, you know, this, that's how you get it done. Those rib rings. Yeah. Yeah. Because like you said, you know, the regular rib, rib rack is, you know, rectangle and you can stack them this way, but usually your ribs are too long to go in that circle anyway. So you, you always got to kind of bend them around anyway. So it's uh, right. Right. And it does more than ribs. That's what's great about it. You know, I do uh chicken drums on there. You just, you know, put them in with the, you know, face up um, chicken wings, you know, when you have the whole chicken wing, just cut the wing tip off and slice down the center between the flat and the point or the flat and the uh, drumette and just lay, you can do like 60 chicken wings that way. Awesome. So yeah, it looks like you guys, you know, you didn't just rest on your laurels, create one uh, product and then just kind of, you know, try to build your whole business on just doing that one product, which, you know, I see some companies do that and I think it's short sighted. You, you've expanded out, you've, but also you've, you know, uh, made sure that you kept up with the technology for the main project. How hard was it? Cause I know that the, the latest one 
was probably the biggest redo you had to do of your um, con controllers because of the fact that now you had to get, you know, Wi-Fi and, and Bluetooth into these things that you never had that before. Uh, how long and what were the trials and tribulations you went through to do that? It was, uh, it was a few years. Um, I had, you know, I was going kind of developing my three to five year plan for the business. Um, I was looking at, you know, new concepts, uh, feature sets for the controls. And, you know, one of the genius things that Fred did way back when was on the DigiQ, on the basic DigiQ, he had the, the display, it's an LED display. He had that pulse when the fan was running. And I asked him why he did that. And he said, well, think about it. He said, um, you know, if you're at a 20 foot distance from your cooker, you're looking out the window. He said that, you know, the fan runs, it's an algorithm that we've developed over the years and the fan will run full time until it reaches a certain set point. You know, when it's so many degrees from your set point, then it will start to pulse and it pulses less and less and less as it gets to your set point. If it goes over temperature, the fan will not run. So he said, by pulsing that display, you can see if it's pulsing full time, it's coming up to temperature. If it's pulsing and stopping and pulsing and stopping, you're at temperature. And then if it's not pulsing at all, you're probably over temperature. And the fourth um, scenario is you've been cooking for five or six hours, seven hours, 10 hours. And the fan goes from a on and off and on to pulsing full time again. That means you're running out of charcoal and it's trying to pick, pick up work. So I was like, wow, that's a great idea. So I always thought, you know, how can we use that in a more profound way? Like how can we design that into the controls? And that's where the light ring came and concept of the light ring having cool blue color and the warm color for being at temperature and then using those pulsing uh, lights to show people if they don't have their phone on them or they're charging their phone or glancing out the window. It's just a great at a glance. What's going on my cooker. If it's red and the sides are pulsing on off on off, you're at temperature. You don't even need to know the number because you know where you set it. Right. If it's cool blue, you're still coming up to temperature. If it's cool blue, 10 hours into the cook, you're running out of coals. You need to go to load some coals in there. And then if the whole thing's flashing red, you're over temperature and needs, it needs attention. All right. Well, I'm going to share the screen this one last time, and we're going to kind of walk through your main products here so people can uh, can see it. And make, you guys can find them at barbecueguru.com. Easy to find. You can also find them on Amazon. I'll put some links in the description below. So we're going to start with the first one. This is the DigiQ, um, your new latest DigiQ. Uh, this is, is this is like the entry level uh, device, correct? Yeah, right. It's the, it's the entry level, but you know, it's a rugged little machine and it's, if you're not, can, if you don't consider yourself like tech savvy, you don't want to deal with wireless and your phone and all that. This is just a, uh, you know, this is the, the main control that people use to just glance at their cooker uh, and you're just using it as a standalone control. Right. So there's a lot of people who aren't, don't consider themselves tech savvy. They don't want to deal with the technology and this is what they go to. Yeah. The well, they don't need to. I mean, I, I see a lot of this technology as overkill uh, where a lot of people will go, Hey, it's neat to have. And, and it's so cheap nowadays though. And, and, and you know, that you might as well have it, but, you know, like like the pellet grills now, they're, they're just pretty much including it because they pretty much have to or they don't sell them. But, um, you know, I can't remember the last time I was at the store and I was trying to look at my phone to see if my pellet grill was still running. <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, it's, right. you know, and like I said, even the sous vide circulators and, you know, kitchen appliances now have this. So this is for somebody that strictly just needs it to make sure if I set it at 225 or 250 for eight hours, I know it's there. I don't have to worry about it. I go out there and two hours later and it's doing the same thing. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, and that's good to have options because, you know, why have one product that, you know, gives them stuff that they don't want to use, you know, you know, why make them buy something that they're not going to use it? Why make them pay the extra money for a Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, all right. that other stuff if they don't need it. Right. So, and we try so, to accommodate, you know, we try to accommodate all, 
price points, you know, exactly yeah. as best we can. So the DynaQ is the next step up, which is strictly Bluetooth, but it also incorporates some of those things you were talking about with the different um, uh, pulse points and colors and all that to give you that same, um, uh, it feels like it's a little bit more of a, a technology built into it because it is Bluetooth just limited range compared to the, uh, to a Wi-Fi control. So, so it gives you a little bit of the, a taste of, of that. So that's your next step up. And, um, right. what does the DynaQ and the ultra Q differences as far as that? Is it strictly the, the Wi-Fi for the ultra Q or is there other things? Yes. So we consider the DynaQ like an entry level wireless model. It's, it's Bluetooth only. It's one food probe, one pit probe. Um, and there's no display. So we were able to offer that at a lower price. And then oh, yeah, the, that's right. There's no display on it. I got you. Right, right. And then the Ultra Q, yeah, so you're relying on your phone for, for all gotcha. that. Gotcha. And then the Ultra Q, then we were able to put a nice big red display in there um, to glance at. It still has the light ring system. It has Bluetooth, and it also has wireless. So if you're not right around your cooker, and you want to leave and, you know, like I can come to work and I can have a load of pork butts on for the weekend and actually change temperatures from my office. I can do that. So the Ultra Q has the big bright red display. It has the capability of handling three food probes plus a pit probe. And then you have your um, your lights at the bottom. There's a light, a different color light above every uh, probe port. So you can have that scan from pit to food one to food two to food three, and the tail of the queue will change the color of that particular probe with the light above it. So once you know, hey, pit, pit one or food one is orange, food two is green, you know, food three is yellow, whatever it is, then you'll know that by the changing of the color tail that that is the temperature of each of the three meats. Gotcha. And now with the both the DynaQ and the UltraQ, do you have do they have the same capability of um, actually doing the charting, or is that strictly in the the UltraQ? That's in the UltraQ. Okay, yeah, because yeah. that's that's Wi-Fi, so that that loads everything up into the cloud and your. Yes. Um, what what's the name of your website that that? Uh, uh, Share my cook is the yeah, engine Share that drives. Cook. Yeah, that's what drives that. So people can actually save their cooks um, and, you know, go back and do comparisons, especially uh, this is really good for competitors where they right. can kind of see how, um, how their pits, you know, operate and how the, how their, their food cooks. I mean, different briskets and different pork butts cook different, you know, sometimes. So absolutely, they can see the difference between a, you know, how a prime cooks over a Wagyu or what have you. And absolutely. The, so there's actually a lot more technology. The, the UltraQ also comes with a uh, a nice mount. I know I, that's the one I have. So I know it's got a, a pretty pretty awesome um, mount that you can actually screw it down if you wanted to, but it's got a magnet at the bottom. So Correct. you can pre pretty much put it anywhere you want. I love the the alligator clip on the uh, the pit probe because um, you know I hate those little uh, metal. Uh, you know, things that they, oh, sort of yeah. other companies give you, they always get lost and, you know, they, they don't bend right or the, the probe doesn't fit in them. Right. So having a little alligator clip is, it, it seems like a little thing, but it's, you know, it, it can save you a lot of hassle sometimes. Oh, absolutely. There's no and, doubt about it. and all of your controllers work with both of your uh, different pit, pit fans. And like I said, the, the pit bowl is for your larger, larger type um, smokers and then the the pit viper is for your smaller ones it works yeah we're all here. works yeah. with alexa too so i mean that's um you got a lot of technology built into it so you guys did a lot of work um putting it all together that's for sure so yes i, th I appreciate that well i know but I remember when I first started playing around with barbecue grooves and it had the, just the little pins, you know, things that you set, you know, to get to the temperature and all that. So, and from where they are now, and it's only been a few years, I mean, yeah. literally just the technology has just moved so quick. I mean, three years ago, I don't think the pellet grills out there had, you know, as much technology as they, they do now. They were just strictly, you know, analog, 
you know, set it to 250 and maybe you're around that temperature. <laughs> and now, exactly. they got, exactly. now they got the PID controllers and, and, uh, you know, digital, you know, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and, and all kinds of, uh, you know, different things that uh, technology built into them. So where do you see this, um, industry going? Do you, you see this keep, just keep on, you know, what other new changes can come about in the next five or six oh. years? Gosh, there's so many, um, I don't want to give away all my secrets of what I'm thinking, but, um, you know, there's just a, you know, making things more convenient, making things more versatile, um, to cook different styles of food outdoors. Um, you know, slick looks, different colors. Um, there's a lot of great ideas out there and I, and I see it, you know, just convenience and versatility are, are the, are the main things that I'm and reliability are the main uh, kind of points that I'm working with to help develop for Min- miniaturization. That seems to be a big thing too. I mean, I literally I'm sitting right now. Um, I'm sure you heard of the meter and the meat stick. Oh yeah. The meat stick just came out with this new, um, this, uh, this is a, uh, uh, beta tester. It's not, they're not, haven't released it yet. I mean, you can pre-order it, but it's, you know, about half the size of their regular, um, wire true wireless thermometer this is wi-fi wow. bluetooth you know all that technology that's just built into this little piece here yeah it's amazing it's just amazing to me um that um that we can do these things now where you know five years ago we couldn't even make something like this and that's right yeah so, yeah it's uh it's going to be interesting to see i mean i I'm, I'm amazed every day um i probably will run into you at the uh you know next um uh, if they ever have these uh, conventions again, like the, uh, the hearth and backyard and patio show or something yes. like that, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm going to try to make the next one up. I think it's up as a Nashville th- next time. Yeah, I believe it is. That's right. It's supposed to be. So we'll see. I might, I might make my way up there. Do you still attend those type of uh, events? Um, uh, yeah, I probably will be there this year. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Well, Bob, I want to appreciate anything else uh, you want to talk about that uh, barbecue guru is working on or that we can expect out of you guys right now. No, just uh, you can check out our line of sauces and seasonings as well. And um, I got a brand new sauce coming out in October that I'm really excited about. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag on that yet. But, um, yeah, check out all our products, our temperature controls. We have some great accessories. Uh, Everybody's home tailgating and cooking for the holidays and small gatherings with family. So we're just we're trying to make your life a little easier and make you successful the first time out. Well, that's another thing too. You actually own a catering business. So how's that? Uh, how does COVID affected your catering business? It has taken it down. Yeah, really? it's, it's, yeah. We uh, we've done a handful of caterings this year. Um, at, you know, and typically we'd be busy like three or four jobs a weekend from beginning of April right through the holidays. But it has been basically shut yeah. down. So, but the good thing is I'm able to focus on the sauce and rub line and. Yeah. Kind of help, you know, build that up. Well, and hopefully when, when everything settles down, it'll, it'll come back and, you know, and gangbusters and, yeah. and then you'll be too busy to do anything and you've had time to work on this other stuff. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for being with me and um, thanks again to everybody. Make sure you check out barbecueguru.com and also you can find their products on Amazon as well. Check out the links below. Uh, Bob, thanks again for being on and I look forward to, more and new and better stuff coming out of barbecue guru thank you so much it was it was wonderful being on take care everybody all righty thanks again all right bye-bye well thanks for joining us on the fire and water cooking podcast i want to thank bob trudnick one more time with barbecue guru make sure you check out the links below also make sure you follow us on our fire and water cooking facebook page group youtube channel and instagram check out the fire and water cooking website And I'll see you again on the next Fire and Water Cooking Podcast.